That can be any planet that has three or more orbiting bodies around it. That would make Jupiter qualify and uh, uh, any planet that has more than three moons circular. Billy took some pictures of the landing tracks. And uh, Bill, uh, again, Simyasu uh, explained to them, you know, why the grass would look the way that it does. And Billy also took some um, friends with him out to see the landing tracks. Uh, at one point, uh, during another occasion, the landing tracks were actually examined by uh, UFO investigators who were on the scene, and it was found that there were some g traces of gamma radiation uh, in the landing tracks as well as they found gamma radiation in Billy's rifle and his boots, and some of it actually got into his lungs somehow. Well, Billy is introduced to someone new. It appears that Simyasi and Quetzal are planning on taking a holiday and returning back to the Pleiades for a period of time, and a lady named Manira is introduced to Billy because she will be Simyasi's replacement while Simyasi is gone. Well, Billy's in the beam ship with Simyasi, and she's explaining this, and they're watching on the sight screen inside of the ship, and Simyasi is uh, telling Billy to watch that pretty soon we'll see Manera's ship coming in on the screen, that it's most unusual looking. It doesn't look anything like a beam ship. Apparently, it's not the saucer formation. It's some other unusual shape. Well, uh, also, it doesn't uh, have tripod landing legs either, so... Uh, uh, it's going to burn some holes in the ground later on that Billy can tell, so take some rather good pictures of. Well, um, Manira lands and comes over into the uh, ship, and they're speaking. Billy meets her. Uh, she looks much different than Simyasi. She's a little shorter, about 10 centimeters shorter. Uh, she's very dark brown skin, kind of uh, Jamaican sort of looking, with very dark hair. It's explained that uh, she actually is comes from a Vega planet, and uh, the planet name is Duran, and she's going to fill in for uh, Simyasi till the end of the year, which would be a period of about three months. Uh, Billy, as soon as he sees her, wants to know uh, if there was any possible connection, because of her look, to the Hottentots of Africa. And she said, well, there is some, that her forefathers had come to Earth a long time ago and had mated with the Huns. And at that time, uh, an offspring of that later developed because the Huns then came together with the African natives that were there and created the Hottentots. So um, this, she said, was one of the original origins of her particular race uh, through that intermixture. Uh, Billy noticed right away some unusual language going on that came to mind. He was curious about the different languages that they spoke. And he asked uh, Simyasi, on the Pleiadian world, is there a name for the language that you speak? And she said, yeah, they call it Sarat, S-A-R-A-T. And they also know another language they call Kosan, K-O-S-A-N. And this was a, the Kosan language was a universal language that most all ETs and uh, highly developed uh, intelligences were aware of. And it was a universal language they could all communicate with each other. Manera's home language, from the, where she came from, was called Janan, J-E-N-A-N. This was Manera's first time on Earth. So uh, Simyasi is kind of uh, uh, commenting to Billy, take it easy on her, don't ask too many difficult questions, that she's here to help out a little bit, and don't make things too difficult for her. Uh, just a quick aside here, uh, on Good Friday on 1976 was a chance for Billy to actually record the sound of the ships, Normally they fly rather quiet. You can't hear anything except maybe a real faint kind of whining sound occasionally because the uh, protection screens around the ship uh, hold the sound from going out so you can't hear the thing. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You don't know if it's there. Well, Billy was driven out to the site by Hans uh, Schutzbach where he's going to record the sound. He gets his recorder out. He goes out into this open area, and he's just standing there with his hand up in the area, and Hans is way back over by the car. And, but even Hans can hear the sound clear over where he's standing. Hans doesn't get to see anything, which is a little frustrating for him. But he can see Billy out there, and Billy's waving. His hand is motioning, and the sound gets a little bit louder. And he records for about 10 minutes, and then he makes kind of a wild gesture for them to stop, and the sound goes away. Um, he's told in later that the sound was caused by the rotation of the outer parts of the ship, as it hits the air. So apparently something is spinning. I, For myself, I didn't know that the Pleiadian ships uh, would spin, and I'm not so sure that they do. It might be energy kind of whirring around the outside of the ship or coming off of the ship. I'm not really sure about that. 
Um, but it could be maybe the outer edge. There could be maybe on the ring on the outer edge of the ship, maybe something actually does spin. I'm really not sure about that. Uh, anyway, one of the interesting things was that, again, apparently Billy had been followed. Because just as he's finishing up uh, taking his sound recording, uh, a car pulls up and there's a couple of police officers in it. Another car pulls up and it's you know somebody else. And suddenly there's like a half dozen people looking in the bushes and looking around to see what's going on with Billy. So he's having a very difficult time at this point going anywhere without being followed. Let's move forward now to the 63rd contact, which was Wednesday, September 22nd, uh, 1976, a day after my birthday. My birthday is September 21st. Um, Simiasi tells Billy that it's been a month or so that uh, since she's seen him, she purposely stayed away because of his poor health. Apparently, Billy's been sick. He's been in bed. He's gotten himself terribly run down, and he's not able to handle the work of his mission. And uh, she uh, kind of gets on him a little bit about that, because repeatedly they're telling him to be more careful with his health, not to overwork himself, that he's going to jeopardize the entire mission if he doesn't take a little better care of himself. So he kind of shakes his head, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Billy was never much one for taking care of himself, so it uh, didn't mean much to him. Uh, on this particular uh, uh, landing, Monera's ship also uh, comes in and sets down the way Billy asked and leaves a burn spot on the ground. So Billy wants to take a picture of that, and he finds out also that Monera's got a beam pistol, some sort of beam pistol, and he asks if he can also take a picture holding that. He thought that would be great fun to uh, take a picture holding the gun and then take a picture of a tree that he'd, you know, he'd cut a tree down or shoot a hole in a tree or something. So they said, yeah, that would be possible that they would arrange for that. It was on this contact that uh, Simiasi tells Billy that Spath, whom he had his first contact with, was her grandfather. And Billy's very surprised by this. He, he didn't know that. Uh, he really never knew too much about Spath. And, but he was kind of surprised. And uh, he says, yeah, I, uh, Spath disappeared on my 16th birthday, and I always just assumed that he probably died. And she said, that's correct. He did, and that was her grandfather. He inquired about the unusual ship that Spath came in because it looked like a pair to him. It was an unusual form. And she said, yes, this ship was a present to her grandfather, and it was from a race of people in Sirius. Apparently in the Sirius area, there are, uh, they have two planets there that inhabit human life. On her 64th contact, which is Saturday, October 2nd, 1976. Billy's decided pretty much he's not going to go public, uh, and he's explaining this to his group. He just can't get himself to do it. He's very frustrated about all the negative thinking that's pushed out against him whenever he tries to go public. He made a couple of attempts to show slides and show people. He's offered his uh, reports to numerous authors, writers, and uh, UFO people. Instead, for the most part, uh, they seem very opinionated and uh, aren't really open to his thinking. And they don't believe him. They make fun of him. So he's finding that this really uh, isn't getting anywhere. A lot of people are hearing about it. He's getting a lot of publicity in the newspapers and magazines and on radio. Some of it okay. Uh, hardly any of it is positive. Most everybody's calling him crazy and a lunatic and so forth. So he's, he's um, uh, really <laughs> kind of giving up on the idea. <clears throat> and Simiasi has a talk with him and says, well, uh, she's trying to build him up again, how important the mission is and how important he is to the, uh, uh, the future of the Earth itself. And that he, he is a great prophet, and it's important that he get all this information out. And Billy's just exhausted with it. He's having a lot of trouble with his family. There's a lot of pressure on him from his wife and his family and his friends. He still lives in Henville, um, Switzerland, and uh, he's having a lot of trouble with the townsfolks. So uh, things are very difficult for him. Well, Simiasi tells him at that point uh, that they're, they're very interested in 